Philip Evans is a senior at Austin Consulting Group and a BCG fellow. He founded BCG's media and internet sectors and has done consulting work with corporations worldwide in consumer goods, healthcare, financial services, media, retail, and high technology industries. We would especially like to thank Mr. Evans for filling in for us at the last minute, so please, a warm round of applause for Mr. Philip Evans. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, today you've witnessed some extraordinary demonstrations of new media, and indeed, Andrew's performance just now is an impossible act to follow. I'd like to start at least by talking about old media, in fact, the oldest of all media literature. In 1945, in fact, in exactly the same month when John von Neumann wrote the original paper that described the architecture of what became the computer, the Argentinian novelist and poet, Jorge Luis Borges, wrote a short story. And in this short story, he described a lost kingdom somewhere, presumably in South America, where the aristocracy was obsessed with cartography, the art of drawing maps. And they cast successive maps of their kingdom, but each one was deemed inadequate and um, replaced, therefore, by something more ambitious. Ultimately, what they created was the perfect map. It was a map of their kingdom on a scale of one to one. The kingdom and the map were to be the same size. And that's the end of the story. It's exactly one paragraph long. Now, Borges was obviously making a lot of very important philosophical points. He was also making the argument that a map on a scale of one to one, when you think about it, is useless because it doesn't contain any information other than the information which you have from reality. But what I want to suggest to you in this very brief talk is that that idea of a map on a scale of one to one is the perfect metaphor for the world that we, in general, but in social media in particular, are building. The world and our map of the world, reality and virtual reality, are increasingly becoming the same thing. We see this in a wide variety of contexts. I mean, for example, take this. This is what the Google car sees. In the bottom left, you see reality as a driver would see it, and in the larger picture, you see what the car sees. And the car, using sensors, using artificial intelligence, is able to interpret its environment in exactly the same way, effectively, as would a human being. The virtual world and the real world, the map and, our, and the reality, have become the same thing. You see this in dozens of contexts. The human genome is a one-to-one -one map, which we can now map for $100 in 20 minutes. You see it in agriculture, where farmers are now able to see the uh, acidity of their soil on a meter-by-meter -meter basis. You see it in social networks, where, of course, what uh, Facebook, for example, what make, makes available um, is the, uh, the universe of the social map. Now, what underlies this? There's fundamentally four trends that make this all possible. We talk about them separately. What we don't do is see them as different parts of the same thing. One is the Internet of Things, the proliferation of sensors in the world, prospectively about 30 billion sensors by the year 2020, connected to the internet and reporting on what they know, what they see, what their status is. Secondly, big data, accumulation of information, among other places from precisely those sensors, the world stock of information doubling um, every nine months. Thirdly, you have mobility, the fact that we each carry, in fact, a collection of sensors on us, which is a source of information, not just about physical things, but about people. Fourthly, artificial intelligence. Data by itself, of course, is not very helpful. You need insight, and the insight comes from 
artificial intelligence. And then finally, what AI is now able to do, what effectively happens when you place your content on platforms like Facebook, is that that insight, whatever it might be, that pattern, whatever it is, is seen, is fed back to the individual in precisely the context where they need it. You don't have to go somewhere to do a search. You have the information available simply by asking Siri. And these universal maps, as I say, are uh, visible in all sorts of contexts. And the most obvious example with respect to this audience would, of course, be social networks. Now, the key element in this is the artificial intelligence, because the artificial intelligence is what makes an infinitely large map comprehensible to us in a way that it wasn't to the aristocracy in, Bourgeois, in Borges's uh, mythological tale. AI has gone through an extraordinary transformation just in the last few years. It's a project that goes back to the 1960s, to MIT. It was the attempt to use science in order to understand how the human mind thinks. And the basic approach for some 40 or 50 years, in fact, was to try to model human reasoning. The highest example of this, I suppose, was probably expert systems, where you would debrief an expert in great detail about how they made a particular decision, and then you would try to model that in code. And the problem with this was that it was expensive, it was difficult, and you didn't get any learning. If you went to a new problem, you had to start from scratch again. The most recent approach, however, is quite different. It's not the effort to understand how we think, it's the effort to understand how the brain works, and that's not the same thing. We're not modeling thought, we're modeling the physical processes of how brains actually operate. And the, the best example of this, of course, is a neural network. It's important, impossible to emphasize how big the, the difference in the approach is. For example, um, every year for some years, Stanford University held a contest called the ImageNet Contest. This was a contest to identify objects in photographs, for example, two men playing football. Now, each year they would have a contest, each year they would publish the results. These were the results year after year. At first glance, that might look like progress, improving error rates, but in fact it wasn't, because the best score each year was essentially the same. But then, in 2012, something happened. A team from the University of Toronto managed to get a score that was a half of that of the previous best. And since then, what's happened is that all of the contestants in the ImageNet contest, academics, researchers from all over the world, have used this neural net technique, a technique which uses statistics rather than logic in order to understand the pattern of what's in photographs. With the result that, in the most recent contest, a Microsoft team won it with a score that is better than that of the average human being. So the problem, this particular problem, the problem of recognizing objects in photographs, um, has now, uh, in, in essence, been solved. Machines can do it better than humans can. But it's very important to recognize that the nature of artificial intelligence is that it is a series of ad hoc solutions to particular cognitive problems. It is not the development of a general human intelligence. So a machine that's capable of winning the ImageNet contest bears, in fact, no relation to the machine that can beat Garry Kasparov at chess, which bears no relation to the machine that can win Jeopardy. We call these things AI, but they're actually completely different and independent technologies. Where is this? The big breakthrough is in this problem of perception. And where is this going? Well, this is probably state of the art. It's what's called captioning. Here we have a graduate student in Amsterdam. He's walking through the streets carrying a laptop. And the laptop is trying to not identify objects, but describe scenes, make statements about what it is seeing. And what you'll observe is that some of these statements are right. A lot of them are quite comically wrong. But the state of captioning is where the state of object recognition was about three or four years ago. And it's confidently expected that this problem will be quickly solved. 
<coughs> beyond captioning becomes the process of telling a story. It's uh, researchers are pretty confident that by 2023 or so, perhaps at the latest, AI technology will be able to watch a YouTube video and summarize it in a grammatical paragraph, essentially as effective as the average human being can. So this is the direction in which the technology is moving. Now, there's a very, very important point to grasp about how this AI progress has been happening. What you have here is a typical boring consultant slide where I've tabulated the various AI uh, breakthroughs as they have occurred. And what you'll observe is that there's two components. One is the mathematics. Some really smart person somewhere developed an algorithm. And the other is the data on the basis of which the algorithm was trained. The interesting point is that if you overlay the dates when the mathematical problem was solved, you'll find that on average it was 18 years before the practical breakthrough. If you look at the date that the data was developed, on average, it was three years. So fundamentally, what's happening here is that is the, A the AI is gated by the data, not by the insight. It is the availability of the data that enables and constrains our ability to use artificial intelligence. And therefore, and this is the key point, whoever owns the data owns the insight. Data becomes the key. That's even more dramatically indicated when you look at the so-called experience curve, the way that the ability of these algorithms to predict improves over time. What you see here is medical um, evidence, uh, uh, the ability of an AI algorithm to diagnose cancer. And what you see is, again, dramatically declining error rates exactly as a consequence of the increasing size of the underlying database. Now, the key question that then gets posed is who controls this world? I won't go through the details here, but if you go back over the history of the computer industry, what you will see is a series of battles for control. And Microsoft ultimately was capped by Google. The social world, in fact, supplanted the world of physical devices. The whole contest moved to the world of, of um, phones. Um, Apple was made the great breakthrough, of course, but now what we see is a contest in which companies like the social network platforms are, of course, again, competing for dominance. If we stand back from the history of this very, very familiar pattern, what we, of course, see is different business models becoming the choke point. Originally, of course, it was Microsoft and Windows. That was, uh, and in the uh, PC, in the mobile side, of course, to some extent, Apple have achieved a similar position. But we also see the emergence of two other critical choke points, one of which is control, and, and they're both cognitive. They're both about how people behave. They're not about creating physical devices or software. One is about intent. And Google, essentially, outside China, have a global monopoly on the ability to address people when they articulate an intent. Facebook, to a lesser extent of dominance, similarly controls attention. And you will notice that so much of the discussion today was around intention. But I would argue, if you look forward, that there's a further evolution going on that we're moving from PCs to smartphones, and we're moving from smartphones to wearables. The general trend is that technology is getting more and more intimate, and more and more, therefore, deeply embedded in our world. The world and the map of the world become the same thing. And in the context of those kinds of devices, devices many of which have not even seen the light of day today, but will come in the next three or four years, what will happen is that there will be a third cognitive layer, a third cognitive choke point, and that will be defined by what you might call ambience. We will, in five years' time, be living in a world where every object is reporting on itself on a direct peer-to-peer -peer basis to any human who is interested in or interacting with it. And that world, that ambient world, which is not the same as the online world, that ambient world will become the world into which social media will have to migrate. So let me summarize, if, my, if I may, with yet another boring uh, consultant's uh, slide um, in, in, in five or six points. First, the world is becoming its own map. This is true in spatial terms, it's true in cognitive terms, and of course it is true in social terms. 
Secondly, AI is key because it is how we perceive that world in a context where the volume of data is infinite. And there are two key breakthroughs, one of which is neural nets, and another, which I didn't really talk about, um, is reinforcement learning. Those are the two technologies that are driving what's happening. Thirdly, in that context, data becomes infrastructure. It is both the enabler and the constraint on our ability to use AI, and therefore fundamental to competitive advantage. If your company does not own the data, you will not be the ultimate beneficiary from artificial intelligence. Fourthly, machines learn. And what we are seeing is the revival of the experience curve in which the accumulation of data becomes critical. And then finally, what we are seeing is the emergence of three distinct cognitive domains, two of which we already know, intent, Google, and attention, Facebook and its peers. But I would argue that this third one, ambience, is appearing. And it is in ambience, the exploitation of ambience through the use of artificial intelligence, that the future of social networks lies. Thank you very much.